My Friend Flicker by Mary O'Hara Chapter 16 Rob had his work cut out for him next day. Banner and the mares had been driven out soon after Sergeant left. Rocket, uneasy and restless, in spite of a good measure of oats poured into a feed box and set on the ground, was kept alone in one of the corrals. The noose, said Nell at breakfast, pouring cream in her coffee. Are you going to bother to take that off before you load her? Rob looked outraged. Do you think I would deliver her with that old string around her neck? Howard and Ken looked at each other. That meant getting Rocket in the chute. Rocket was to be got into the chute, then she was to be got into the truck. Who'll drive the truck? asked Nell. I'll drive it myself. I'll take Gus along. Might need him. Breakfast was eaten quickly. McLaughlin hurried up to the corrals. Gus was told to fill the truck with petrol and oil and get it ready for the trip. Tim was to help in the chute. They moved Rocket through the corrals without much trouble. But when she was once more in the small coop which led to the chute, and the heavy gate closed behind her, she began to snort and rear. The narrow passage into the chute was open before her, but even though they urged her and yelled at her and flapped blankets and quirts over the fence on her back, she was too wise to go in. She could see through, and at the far end, a heavy door blocked escape. It's that door, said McLaughlin. She seems that there's no way through the chute. We'll have to open that door and let her see daylight through. Then perhaps if I rush her from here, I can drive her through. Ken, you get up there on top of the chute wall, close by the door. Open the door. If she rushes in, you slam the door shut. It's going to take quick thinking and quick action. You can lean down and handle the door from the top. It's not easy. Mind you don't fall down into the chute. The door swings from inside out. If you get it three quarters shut and she crashes against it, She'll shut it the rest of the way herself. Ken climbed up on the wall of the chute, unsteady with excitement. McLaughlin, blanket on arm, climbed a few bars of the fence of the coop. Ready, Ken? Open the door. Ken leaned over and hauled the door open, and at the same moment, Rob gave a yell and flapped the blanket on Rocket's haunches. Rocket saw the daylight at the far end of the chute and plunged through. Ken closed the door again, just in time. The mare crashed in against it. She was right under him, and as he pulled back, she reared and her great head and wild eyes were in his face. Pull, Tim! shouted McLaughlin, and Tim, standing ready, thrust through both walls of the chute a heavy pole to cut off her backward escape. It was at the height of the mare's haunches, too high for her to get her feet over, and not so high that she could back under it. When she came down on all four feet again and felt the pole behind her, she began to fight. McLaughlin climbed the wall of the chute opposite Ken and struggled to get hold of the frantic creature's head. She reared again and this gave him a chance to grasp the rope with both hands. She shook her head and tried to tear loose. He hung on and was almost dragged over the wall. She screamed, thrust out her head with bare teeth. McLaughlin ducked and she dropped again, breaking his hold. She put her head down on the ground and kicked. Her legs struck the wall of the chute, and one got over the pole. But in the wild fury of plunges, which this caused, she got it free. Then she reared again. And McLaughlin had another chance at her head. Ken watched the look of hot anger combined with implacable determination on his father's face. He had the clippers in his right hand, waiting his chance. Suddenly Rocket dropped to the earth and stood quiet a moment, her sides heaving with breaths that were almost groans. And McLaughlin reached his hand down, clipped the rope, and it fell free. But at that instant the mare reared sharply again. McLaughlin could not draw back quickly enough, and the top of her head struck him in the face. Ken saw the blood spurt from his father's eye as Rocket's foam-flecked head described a complete backward arc, and she crashed to the ground, breaking the pole behind her. 
For a moment, McLaughlin clung to the wall, swearing, one hand to his face, while the mare fought madly below him, her feet thundering on the walls, her great body flinging itself from one side to the other. McLaughlin got down and put his bandana to his bleeding face. One eye was swelling rapidly. That's that, he said, going around into the corrals. Rocket, screaming and grunting, was struggling desperately to right herself. She had fallen so far backward that her head and neck were almost in the coop. This gave her forelegs more freedom, and by vigorous writhings and twistings, pushing and kicking with her legs, she forced herself out of the chute and into the coop, and immediately scrambled to her feet. We're all set now, Gus, said McLaughlin. Bring the truck in there, back it up against the far end of the chute. Tim, you get the runway and set it in the chute. We'll drive her right through the chute, up the runway and into the truck. Better fix dot I, boss, said Gus, looking at Rob's face. Undead cheek, dot's bad cut, split wide open. Let Mrs. Fix up for you. Rob held the handkerchief over his eye. He looked down at himself. He was spattered with foam and blood. He frowned. Yes, I'll go down and clean up. Gus, I don't want any more trouble with that mare. You never can tell what she'll do. Once she's in the truck, we're pretty safe. But to get her there is the trick. Better saddle Shorty. I'll ride him through the chute and up the runway. And there's a chance she might follow him into the truck. While Tim and Gus manoeuvred the truck until its back was flush against the door of the chute, Rob went down for first aid. I think it really needs stitches, Rob, said Nell, examining it closely, having washed her hands in hot water and soap, and laid out all her first aid kit on the kitchen table. It's on the cheekbone, below the eye, really a wide cut. Deep? asked Rob. Not so very deep. Fix it with tape, then. Nell held the lips of the wound closed until the bleeding had nearly stopped, then made little bridges of narrow adhesive tape across, and finally, a dressing overall. Then she put both arms around his neck and laid her cheek against his, holding him closely. He felt a slight tremor through all her body. Don't worry, honey, he said. It's nothing. He patted her on the shoulder. Suddenly his arms held her hard, and he kissed her. Then he went upstairs to change into spotless whipcord riding breeches, polished boots, and tailored jacket. Back up at the corral again, the loading was accomplished with comparative ease. Shorty was ridden up the incline into the truck. Rocket followed. Shorty was ridden down again, and before Rocket could follow, the back of the truck was closed and escape was shut off. She was neatly enclosed in the six-foot walls of the truck, made of sturdy two-by-fours bolted together. She reared, she clawed at the rails, she neighed wildly, she plunged and leapt again, again. Her feet slid out from under her and she crashed to the floor and scrambled up to begin all over. But there was nothing she could do. No one paid any attention to her any more. Rob picked the old piece of lariat, triumphantly out of the chute, and draped it around his own neck. He and Gus got into the box of the truck, and the boys begged to ride along as far as the turn onto the highway. They passed the house, the boys hanging on the steps of the truck, shouting goodbye to Nell, who came out to wave to them. But Rocket's story was not yet ended. Where the ranch road turned off from the Lincoln Highway was the sign of the ranch. Every rancher is proud of his ranch sign, under which all visiting cars must pass, and exercises great ingenuity in thinking up something striking and effective. McLaughlin's sign was a high square arch. On the broad horizontal board, which was the span of it, he had painted Goose Bar Ranch, in red letters against a blue ground. To each side were reproductions of his brands. As they reached the sign, Rocket's wild eyes were upon it, this strange bar bearing down upon her from the skies, and she reared to meet it. Standing astretch on her hind legs, 
her head up. The sign caught her a blow on the top of the brow. There was a great crash in the truck. McLaughlin glanced back anxiously. He pulled up, and they got out and climbed up over the sides. But Rocket lay motionless. Rob got into the truck, against Gus's anxious warnings. But there was no danger, for Rocket never moved again. The men stood about the truck, not daring to speak until McLaughlin made a move. The colour was flooding up into his face all round the swollen purple part, and there was the look of blazing fury in his eyes, which Ken expected. To be balked or beaten, to lose something he prized, this always put McLaughlin into a rage. He laughed harshly. Well, there you are, he shouted. I'm glad of it. No more trouble. Wish I'd shot her and all the rest of her tribe years ago. Gus, take the truck up to the old mine and dump her in. I'll walk home. Another truck was turning in off the highway. It came abreast of them and drew up. Williams, come back, as he said he would, for a load of cheap horses. I'll sell you a carcass, McLaughlin joshed, as Williams climbed out of his truck. They explained what had happened. Williams climbed up the side of McLaughlin's truck and looked in. What a piece of luck, he said. A fine big mare. But I've seen things like that happen before. A little bit of a blow can kill a horse, provided you land it in the right place. I've got a load of horses for you, Williams, said McLaughlin, with a strange look in his eyes. A bunch of bronx. Bring them on, said Williams jocularly. If we can load him, I'll buy him. All the kith and kin of this mare, said McLaughlin savagely, ought to be some good horse flesh, if they're anything like her. How many? Hardly know myself. They're all over the range. We'll have a time rounding them all up. I've got all day. I'll send Tim back to help you, Gus, said McLaughlin, and rode back to the ranch in Williams's truck. When Tim came, he and Howard and Ken rode up to the old mine with Gus to see the last of Rocket. The boys lay on the ground at the edge of the deep shaft, their faces hanging over, while the men backed the truck close to the hole, fastened ropes to Rocket's hoofs, passed them around a tree opposite, and with this leverage were able to drag the carcass to the very edge of the open back of the truck. They removed the ropes, got in the truck, and using poles as levers, shoved and pushed at the inert black mass. She moved slightly. She was sliding. Suddenly she was over. The boys saw the great body plunge, caroming from side to side, the hoofs turn up, the mane and tail whipping and winding. Then the darkness swallowed her. Nothing. And a long silence before the jarring thud. 300 feet below. They shook the earth they were lying on. Sitting at dinner in the kitchen, Williams said, If I may be so bold, why do you wear the piece of lariat around your neck, Captain? Someone been roping you? Everyone laughed but Nell. Her face coloured up. She reached over and pulled the rope from Rob's neck, went to the stove, and lifting the lid off, dropped it into the fire. The rest of the day was spent rounding up horses of all ages, descendants of the albino. At first no one had believed that McLaughlin really meant what he said, that every single one of the albino's blood, no matter how beautiful, how fast or how promising, was to be sold. But as the hours went on, and one after the other was gathered into the corrals, and still they went out on horseback to gather more, with Nell busy with the stud book and names, it became apparent that he was earnest. Ken and Howard were kept at the gates, opening and shutting them as the different bands were brought through, taken down to the corrals, the one bronc picked out and held, the others sent out again. Gus and Tim and Ross were all riding, and that's every last one of them, said Nell at length, closing the book. Her voice was regretful. She and Williams were in the stable, 
looking out into the corrals over the top of the Dutch door. The two boys were perched safely on the corral fence, Rob and the men in the corral with the milling Bronx. Except Flicker, murmured Kent, and he looked across the corral at his mother and caught her eye. She was looking at him too, thinking he knew the same thing. He had not been exactly worried about Flicker. After all, she was his own. His father had given her to him. She couldn't be sold without his consent. Nine of them, said McLaughlin, counting, and Williams went out of the stable into the corral. Now began a long period of bargaining. With the horses under their eyes, McLaughlin and Williams argued until the watchers were tired. I could get ten in the truck, said Williams. Haven't you got another to throw in? I might have, said McLaughlin. But let's settle the price of these first. They did some figuring on bits of paper, and finally the deal was closed. McLaughlin walked over to Ken, called him down from the fence, and walked away with him. Ken, he said quietly, I'm going to give you a chance to do a sensible, manly thing. I want you to choose another colt, and let me sell Flicker to Williams with the rest of this hell's brew. A wave of heat rushed all over Ken's body. He looked down, dug with his toe in the gravel of the path, and shook his head. McLaughlin was quiet and persuasive. You've seen for yourself what can you expect? It's for your own sake I'm asking, as well as to save myself the trouble and unpleasantness of trying to help you do something which is impossible. What's the use of having another rocket on your hands? You've seen what end she came to, and no one could have tried harder with a horse than I tried with her. But I'm going to tame Flicker, whispered Ken. Sometimes bad horses get tamed. McLaughlin's voice rose angrily. Look up! Ken looked up and was more frightened than ever. His father's face looked appalling. It was swollen, out of all shape. One eye was closed by purple and black lumps above and below, and the white dressing on the cheekbone was surrounded by an inflamed, angry circle. Are you going to be a bull-headed little simp or a sensible boy? Ken said stubbornly. Dad, I have to have her. She's mine. He really meant, she's me. It felt as if his father were asking him to be torn apart. For me, Ken, then, and for your mother, let's have a pleasant summer. Let's have something turn out right. Ken shook his head and suddenly felt his father's hand on his shoulder, gripping with such strength it hurt him. I'd like to shake the teeth out of your stubborn head, said McLaughlin savagely, then turned around and strode back to the stable. Ken followed his heart pounding, but triumph singing within him. Flicker was his. She couldn't be taken. That's all, shouted McLaughlin. Nine of them. Now we'll load them. With the assistance of Shorty, the Bronx were driven through the chute into the truck and penned in. The truck stopped at the house, while Williams made out a check to Rob. Though it wasn't as much of a check as he would have got for Rocket, Yet it was big enough to bring a little satisfaction into his one open eye. Want to ride out to the highway in the car, Rob asked Nell, and see the last of them. They all got into the Studebaker and followed Williams along the road, watching the struggles of the horses in the truck. Although they were tightly packed, several of them, frantic with fear, were being troublesome. One of them kept rearing and got his forefeet over one side. The truck tilted going along the side of the hill, and suddenly the impossible happened. The bronc clawed up the side to a hold, got his body across it, and toppled over. It was a tremendous fall, as the hill sloped down forty feet or so, and the bronc went bounding, rolling, and somersaulting to the bottom. Rob brought the Studebaker to a stop. They all jumped out and stood watching while Williams halted his truck and got down from the box. When the bronc hit the bottom of the hill, he leapt to his feet and stood, apparently unhurt, looking around in a comical, surprised fashion. Everyone began to laugh. Williams came back to McLaughlin. It'll make me too late if I go back and load him again. Rob took his cheque out of his pocket. 
Here's my fountain pen. Make me out a new cheque. Take the price of him off. Williams hastened to do so as he knew that, once the Bronx had been loaded in his truck and his cheque given, the loss should have been his and not McLaughlin's. He said jocularly as they exchanged cheques, I'll let you feed him for a year and I'll buy him from you on my trip next summer. McLaughlin said, on your way. You want to get to the border before dark. And by the way, drive around the sign out there by the highway, not under. You bet. Well, so long. Williams climbed into his truck and drove away. The bronc was running about the meadow, looking around in an odd, startled fashion as if he didn't know where he was. Suddenly he began to gallop hard. Then his head went down, he turned head over heels, lay still a moment, got up, began to gallop. The boys looked at their father, trying to read in his face the explanation of this strange behaviour. The bronc was certainly acting in an unnatural manner. Nell knew, with a sick feeling in her heart, that the beautiful young thing was injured. McLaughlin's face was set and hard, his eyes narrowed. They stood in silence watching the colt, going through the strange gyration over and over, galloping, turning head over heels, lying still a moment, then getting up and galloping again. At last McLaughlin said, Is the Winchester in the car? Yes, said Howard promptly. You put it in the back when we went to look for the wildcat, remember? And told us to leave it there. Get it. McLaughlin took the gun, then said, Nell, you go on home with the boys. Oh, can't we stay? said Howard. No, bad enough to have to shoot him. This isn't a show. Nell drove away with the boys, and McLaughlin took a careful position on level ground and raised the gun to his shoulder. He wanted to be sure. There was a long wait until the colt came to a pause in his gambols. When at last he did, standing in the same comical, surprised fashion, as if asking what was going to happen, there was a sharp crack off the Winchester. The bullet whined. The echoes came thundering back softly from the hills, and the colt went gently down in the deep grass of the meadow. And that's the last of them, said McLaughlin, as he lowered the rifle and stood a moment watching to see if there was any movement in the grass. Then he ejected the empty shell and added savagely, except flicker. That's the end of chapter 16.